The psalmist saith, The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this has been quite a week for God's people living in this country. A week that I thought would be marked primarily in the life of the church by the Feast of the Epiphany. You know, we had all the, we had these celebrations and the baptism of the Lord, and I had this wonderful sermon already in the bag for this morning about, you know, you have the heavens tearing open, you got the water, you got the Holy Spirit. It was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. But there do come moments, even for those of us who hold ourselves most strictly to Catholic disciplines about not deviating from the lectionary, you know, it's like you have, you know, everything in the world can be, you know, going up in flames around you, but you preach the lessons that are assigned. There come times when one must deviate from those disciplines. That has come only once before, and for me, and it kind of has, I have thought through being a priest and being in a pulpit, that has only come one time before now in my vocation. And that was the Sunday after the Sandy Hook Massacre. That was Third Advent. I know it well, I remember it well. I preached on the Holy Innocence on that Sunday. And this is the second Sunday in nearly 20 years of ministry that I feel compelled to deviate from the lessons assigned in the feast, assigned by the church, to speak to this moment. Now, I have, as I've reflected upon this, I recognize that over the course, even if, you know, you've only had me for two years, it's been about two years. Last Sunday was like the two year anniversary or so. Last It was Epiphany Sunday, two years ago. So even in those two years, you probably have gotten a view kind of of the overall contours of my point of view. I have criticized the state with a capital S, kind of in its philosophical reality. I've criticized the state. I have uh, talked about, you know, as Christians' uh, vocation to eschew all manner of violence, to reject violence. And named, I have named the state as a primary perpetrator of that violence. And so today, it does occur to me that to, in order to, in a sense, out of sheer intellectual and moral integrity, I need to articulate, in view of those prior criticisms of the state, why it is that followers of Jesus should be upset about what we saw on Wednesday, other than that people got hurt, right? I mean, if, 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 if nobody had gotten hurt, would we still, would Christians, followers of Jesus, still be upset about what happened? Or, you know, again, a fair reading of some of what I've said could lead you to say, well, you know, the world is the world, and the church is the church. Now, in my criticisms of the state, They've been largely a way to draw a contrast as starkly as possible between what the church must be as a witness to the kingdom of God in our midst right, versus the world to which we are called to be in mission, right? Is in large part has been to kind of be able to help the, the people of Jesus understand that the world does need a different kind of message than politicians can deliver. And that we do follow Jesus, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and thus who is a Lord of, and Savior who transcends politics, right? and whose own politics, meaning in the broadest sense of people organizing to come together and form a common life, that Jesus' own politics forms a challenge to all human politics in every time and place. And that's one of the things I've tried to get across. And I always try to attempt to deconstruct the enlightenment patterns of thought that so dominate American Christians, both on the left and the right. We are all children of the enlightenment. And I want to you all to claim your true childhood in the kingdom of God. Primarily because I see the Enlightenment as a source of 
the zero-sum rights game, which in many ways has led us to the bankruptcy of our current moment, right? In a sense, if I get more, that means you get less. And if you get more, that means I get less. That there's another way, as Paul would say, a yet more excellent way of being in relationship to each other than the language of rights. But again, after Wednesday's puch, I was provoked to get clear for myself so that I could share with you why the gospel, why following Jesus' way of mercy and suffering love underwrites and indeed demands a democratic, with a small d, a democratic civil order. In a sense, why is democracy for Christians worth saving? Why is it something that we would value? Again, I'm the kind of preacher who I, I kind of try to ask those basic questions. Why should, you know, other than that's just what we do as Americans, right? You know, it's, it's our way. Well, that's not good enough for followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus don't look at the, just the way we do things in our tribe and say, well, that's just the way we do things, and I'm sure God is good with it. That's not the Jesus way. Jesus' way is to always interrogate our human inheritances in light of God's way of mercy and love. To always ask those questions, interrogate the ways that we take for granted as we make our way in the world. So, in my judgment, one of the key one of the key build, you know, as foundation stones of a democracy, of a democratic civil order, is the rejection of violence as a means to any public good. A democracy is founded on the idea that I am not going to try to kill you to get what I want as a public good. In fact, it's a commitment to the idea that killing other people violates the public good. It is, in some ways, a leaning into doing life with those who don't follow Jesus, but in such a way that we can begin to realize those aspects of the Sermon on the Mount that talk about someone strikes you on the cheek, right? turn the other, Right? If someone asks you to walk a mile, walk the second one. Pray for your enemies. You know, you have heard it said, love your neighbors, hate your enemies. We've seen plenty of evidence of that. Basically, we could substitute love your party, hate the other one. Across the spectrum of political engagement. But democracy is an ordered rejection of violence as a means to achieving the public good. Democracy, in a sense, is a willingness to lose. You, you, it, it, to have a democracy, all parties involved, in a, sense, in a sense, it's like coming together to play a board game in which everyone agrees ahead of time, one person will win and the rest of us will lose, and then we'll play another game in which that person will lose and someone else might win. That's the nature of the game. That's the nature of life together. If we're gonna do life together, if we're gonna sit around this table, right, and roll dice and play this, you know, then we have to acknowledge that somebody's going to lose. And you sign up for losing. That's the thing, that's the crazy thing about democracy. In a sense, why democracy requires Christian virtue. And that when Christian virtue a commitment to Jesus wanes in a culture, democracy becomes more difficult to sustain. Because people are just simply not willing to lose. I am not willing to lose. To be, you know, like, I like to gore everybody's ox. And I look forward in the next four years to goring liberal oxen. Just as I've gored other oxen in the last four years. I saw, you know, and being, you know, I tend to hold my cards very close to my chest. I think that's my job. 
It's part of the restraint, part of the discipline of being a pastor. So that means that I still do have friends that are on both sides of the political spectrum on my Facebook feed. I still got them. And I watch. And in some ways, what I saw around the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court, there was a similar unwillingness to lose. To say, this has, this has in fact, we don't like it, but this has in fact proceeded according to constitutional order. But we're going to try to go around and we're going to try to undo that. I'm just saying, it's a similar impulse. Are you willing to lose? That's the fundamental nature of a democracy with a small bean, right? Of a democratic civil order. And Jesus leads us into a posture of humility and forgiveness that makes losing within that democratic civil order possible or willing to personally sustain because we have a longer view. The view of Jesus' people is supposed to be beyond the election cycle. Right? One would imagine, right? I mean, we're talking about an eternal kingdom, then maybe we need to take some of the eggs we have in those baskets and move them somewhere else, like to the church. Maybe we should have about as many eggs in those baskets as we have in college sports. And I say this to Texans. Football, right? People get pretty heated up about football, but you know that would actually be an improvement in our current civil order. Just take some eggs out of this basket and give them to Jesus. Care about Jesus's mission, Jesus's agenda. So. That is one gospel principle, a rejection of violence, a willingness to not kill. That, my friends, is a radical conviction. It was radical in, in the, at the time of the adoption of the Constitution in 1787, and it remains radical today. Just look around the world. It is a radical conviction. I will lose before I kill you. That's really, when you boil it down, that's what democracy is, and that is something that really, in my judgment, can only be sustained in the long term and sincerely with some sort of relationship to Jesus. Because if you don't believe in Jesus, if this world really is all there is, then I'd say, go at it, hammer and tongs. I mean, go and get yours. I mean, if this world really is all there is, then, you know, I don't see why not. It is, unless, you know, to be a nice person, but whatever that gets you. I mean, if, that, if you can monetize being nice, then go ahead and do that. But if you believe in Jesus, there's a longer view. There's a different set of values. There's a kingdom for which we are called to contend. Part of a, a kind of a corollary of that is that because we reject violence as a means to any public good, it also means that we rule out seeing policy disagreements as the boundary between enemies. You know, it's, it's, it's now it's like a rhetorical cliche, but it's like my worthy opponent. You know, it's like blah blah. You know, it's like you know is. Can't see the his nose at the end of it. You know, it's like, you know, but it's all that you're worthy opponent. But the whole idea is that you would actually think of your opponent as someone worthy. The fact is that I see this in families <laughs> as well as in our civil order. You will get the opponent that you deserve. <laughs> so if your opponent is unworthy, that is a direct reflection on the relationship that you have contributed to forming over time. But part of the commitment to a democratic civil order is ruling out policy disagreements as the boundary between enemies. And again, if Jesus' people can model for those around us putting eggs, taking eggs out of those baskets, what I call kind of emotional eggs, out of those baskets, 
that people who disagree with us are not our enemies. But rather, it leads to the second kind of sub-principle under the rejection of violence. It means that a democratic civil order, along with being a follower of Jesus, means that persuasion is perceived to be the means to victory. Persuasion, not coercion. In a democratic civil order, we agree together that I need to convince you that I'm correct. And so those who disagree on, along policy lines right, are not enemies, but those yet to be persuaded. That's, I mean, that is the fundamental. I, I feel like we just, this is a moment in our civil life where we just have to kind of break it down. Like, what is involved here in living together? And I see this as a gospel view, that the people of God, we knew this when this movement first started, but then we forgot it, say, for about 1,500 years, that the gospel, a commitment to Jesus, is not something that can be forced upon someone. Truly, you can force a cultural identity on someone. That you can do. You can force an, a cultural identity. You can say you're no longer get to speak your language, you, you know, whatever. But you can't force someone to love. You can't, that love can never be coerced. Obedience can be coerced, but not love. So therefore, we as Jesus' people, we recognize that to serve the gospel means that persuasion is our key, in our, our key tool in the toolkit. In a sense, we have to be able to do it. To serve the gospel, we have to be persuasive, not forceful, in the presentation of our way of life as followers of Jesus. We know this. We need to persuade people, and mainly by how we live. So if you're in a political side of things that focuses on personal responsibility, then be personally responsible. Go out and model that. Right? But we're called to persuade. Persuasion is the means of victory and the fundamental task of leadership. That to be a leader means to be persuasive, not coercive. And when you have a civil order in which persuasion, the, the ability to persuade others, is depressed, it only the only other the only other option is to coerce. Those are those are, that's the zero sum game. So a commitment to persuasion. And here's another gospel principle. That we learn this from following Jesus. In order to persuade you about Jesus and the way of love, I need to understand you. I need to come alongside. I need to, I need to experience some form of fundamental human solidarity with you. If I expect to persuade you in the deepest possible sense of Jesus' way. That, in, that is to say, not only in the way that I speak to you, but in the way that I live with you, I must persuade. That I also must come alongside and not reject that which is different from me from the get-go. And that also is something that we are in danger of losing, and which people of Jesus are called to remind our neighbors. That is, in some ways, and I see that, again, this is, a, this is across the political spectrum. For example, as an example, and again, I'm just going to gore all the oxen. Hopefully I make everybody mad. But in the end, I hope to be persuasive. For example, on the right, kind of on the, towards the right of center of American politics, right, there tends to be like, for example, with dealing with Islamic terrorism. Right? They're terrorists, right? Which is, you know, acts of violence, bad. Right? I already, that's what I led with. Violence, bad. <laughs> and to put a card on the table, if you haven't figured it out yet, right? I am a pacifist. But consistently. A consistent pacifist. So that means I don't really have a home in any party. 
that's okay because I have a home with Jesus. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's part of my mission in preaching is to pull you into a home with Jesus and out of your home with all those secular identities you have. So you have a home in the kingdom and not a home in a party. Whatever it might be. Whatever it might be. But in a sense, there seems very, there was, there, you know, in the war on terror, there was very little curiosity about what were the factors driving these young men in their early 20s to strap on bombs and walk into crowds of people and blow themselves up. What has to happen to someone to make that happen to them? Not a whole lot of curiosity about that to our cost. At the same time, I see very little curiosity among my friends on the left, judging from Facebook feeds, about what it takes to make someone go get a tiki torch and show up in Charlottesville and say, the Jews will not replace us? Who's gonna replace you, kid? You're being replaced because you're playing video games all day and you're hooked on OxyContin. That's why you're being replaced. What has to happen to somebody to get them to that demonstration? What has to happen to somebody to get them inside the Capitol building? We need to recover a curiosity about what are the factors that are contributing towards a giving up on peace, a giving up on the democratic civil order, and an adoption of violence, an unwillingness to lose. What contributes? I mean, and that's really, in a sense, what you, Islamic terror or white nationalistic terror, both of those reflect an unwillingness to lose. I am not willing to lose before I kill you. I mean, that's just, and so we as Jesus' people, we're always called part of what it means to be in solidarity with those who suffer means to be curious about what's going on. What is the suffering? What is going on? What is the cause of the woundedness? How do I contribute? In the same way that we, that, 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 that we ask questions, how do we contribute? Right? We know this in a family, right? I mean, in a sense, you, in, unless you're going to have really quickly broken family relationships, we understand that you have to ask yourself, how do I contribute to this broken relationship, right? How do I contribute to this pattern? The other person isn't the wrongdoer 100%. That we have a tango going on here. We need to recover this sense of curiosity about the suffering of others and how it drives them to violence. In the same way that we have a curiosity about those who suffer from mental illness, what's going on, how can we help? And so, in a sense, democracy requires a form of relational evangelism, as I've been suggesting, of relational persuasion. Not persuasion at a distance, not persuasion by post, not persuasion by tweet, not persuasion by social media, but a relational persuasion, doing life together. And we as Jesus' people, have, we can teach, hopefully, if we haven't forgotten how to do this, we can teach this. And it also comes with a clear humility about what can be imposed. And ultimately, two more points, hang in there with me. It's like, kind of like, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I know this is... <laughs> Penultimately, another key principle of a democratic civil order that is shared with the gospel Right? And in many ways, I think, underwritten by the gospel, made possible by a commitment to Jesus' way, is the affirmation of the fundamental dignity of every person. A commitment to the fundamental dignity of every person, of every human being. We say that in our baptismal liturgy, right? The dignity of every human being. But in a sense, the democratic civil order means that every person counts. The famous in the early 60s, you had the Baker v. Carr decision, which the famous, you know, kind of one man, one vote, right? The idea that if you have 100 people in this county, 
they get the same number of votes as the 100 people in that county when it's in the state legislature. That's a fundamental principle, right? I mean, it's just, it's math, one to one. That everybody matters, everybody counts, everybody has a dignity, everybody's value. That is democracy at its best. Now this comes in, and this in a sense plays out in two different ways. On the macro level, it touches upon the verse that I mentioned from the psalmist. A fundamental commitment of Israel and of the church in its earliest days, the Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord sits enthroned, i.e. not anybody else. No one else gets to be king. That's, that was a monotheistic commitment of Israel. If you read Israel's history, the, you know, the book of Sam, you know, Samuel and Kings, in some ways it's a meditation on, we forgot this and went and got ourselves a king. Right? And, that, you know, and Saul, and then, now David was, was, was great, but that was broken. That broke really quickly and just went downhill. That's the, Israel's history is a negative commentary on kings. On those who would hand power on to hold power for their whole lives or hand power on to their children. And then Jesus' people forgot that lesson along the way. Medieval period. Uh, <laughs> into modern period. Okay. But the idea is that a Christian commitment is that because Jesus is king. And that was one of the radical points of the, of the Christian proclamation. That when, G, that when Paul says Jesus Messiah or King Jesus in his letters, the idea here is that Jesus is, C, is Lord and Caesar is not. That was the fundamental claim that got Christians tortured and killed in the Roman Empire. That Jesus is king and Caesar is not. So in a democratic civil order then, when you lose, you sit out the next round. That's, that's one of the things about democratic civil order. Right? That we don't have kings in this country. We're in a democratic civil order. God is king. Right? And then we all are fellow servants. And a democratic civil order says that not only were we all fellow servants, but we aren't, there aren't like, and again, I'm sorry for the fans of the crown, we all love watching the crown, but the, the, the fact is that in the gospel, there aren't dukes and earls and blah, blah, blah. It's that we're all equals. And that to pursue a more perfect democratic order means to extend the dignity of personhood fully in the human family. And we struggle to do that, but that's part of the work of the democratic civil order is to extend dignity to the fullness of the human. So as we have raised up the dignity of our gay brothers and sisters, rightly, there are those of us also who remember now, I'm, I'm consistent, you know, consistent across the spectrum, we are all, I also join those who, like in the 1830s through the 1850s, seek to extend full personhood to a class of persons that are per perceived to be not fully human, i.e. the unborn. You know, I kind of want to say, are they three-fifths person, one-third person? You know, you tell, you tell me how much of a person the unborn is. Because my commitment is that every human person has infinite dignity. And so if you remember back to eighth grade math, Infinity divided by three, whatever you you know, infinity times one third is still infinity, right? See, when you're consistent, the math is easy. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's easy. So we are called as a democratic people with a small d to follow the gospel's call to extend the dignity of personhood to the entire human family. Even if I were to grant you that some of it is potential, I don't care. One tenth, still infinity. That dignity gets extended to the entire human family.
That's a commitment. Finally, finally, we're bringing the plane in for a landing. American democracy, American democracy in particular. So far I've been talking about kind of more of an abstract democratic civil order. But what do I see, Rob Price, who I've been, I've been you know, critical of America as a project, because it's an enlightenment project. <laughs> Born in the enlightenment, it can't help it. But American democracy in particular holds out a special gospel promise, not because, since we're so, you know, we're so awesome, not because we're a military superpower, not because we have some sort of special responsibility to the rest of the world, whatever. I think American democracy's particular gospel promise lies precisely in the historical accident, almost the un, you know, that, that happened unwillingly on the part of elites. And not just elites, but like anybody who was already here is because of immigration over the last 300 years, right? American democracy is a multi-ethnic, multicultural project. Now I say this as you know, my people were here really early, you know, as I mentioned about 1623 or so, right? After the first massacre, we let the we let the Native Americans do the first one, and then we it's like okay, now it's safe. We're going to come from. But pretty early on, and you know, so it says wave upon wave, right? There were, you know, we have to remind ourselves that there was a day when the Irish received, were perceived to be not us, right? By my people. Poles were not us. But American democracy, as we have it now, in my judgment, stands as a particular with particular gospel potential precisely because it is multi-ethnic and multicultural project. American democracy is almost a Pentecost as a polity. It's like America is in a sense almost like Pentecost has a constitutional order. Many tongues, many peoples, but speaking a language of commitment to nonviolence, speaking a language of commitment to the dignity of every human person, speaking a dignity or speaking a commitment to being willing to lose as we live together. That, in my judgment, is America's promise and America's challenge, is to work out how to do those things. We all know that all those things are tough to, tough to do in our families. Right? <laughs> They're tough to do in the family, to be willing to lose when it's more than just about do we do Mexican or Greek or Italian. I mean, you have to be willing to lose with the big stuff if you're gonna make it as a family. Even more so, how hard is it when you don't perceive the other person to be family to you, kin to you, and yet we're called to build a common life together. In this sense, unhappily in America, the churches are farther away from the kingdom than our culture. A culture which, if you look at entertainment culture, it celebrates diverse voices and different musical influences. And in the church, we have a hard time doing that. As Martin Luther King said, right, 10 a.m., I forget what hour he is, but roughly 10 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. And that remains our challenge. And so Jesus' people, as we try to teach our culture, our democratic civil order, all these values upon which the democratic civil order depends, rejection of violence, dignity of every human person, a commitment based in humility to be willing to lose, etc., etc., we also, as Jesus' people, come to this, appropriately enough, with something to learn as well. A learning how to be a community across ethnic and other divisions. And this is why I'm so passionate about the work that the cathedral has been doing around racial reconciliation, around engaging our sister churches like Truly Missionary Baptist, 
This is why we do that. It's not to be nice people. It's to be Jesus people. That's why we're doing that. That's what we're called to be engaged in South Dallas. That's why we're called to build relationships with followers of Jesus. Let's start with the followers of Jesus. That's hard enough. But building relationships with other followers of Jesus so that we can, in a sense, lean into that Pentecost polity that is Jesus' desire for the church and for the nations. Jesus prayed that his disciples would be one as he and the Father are one. St. Paul tells us that Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility and made out of many humanities one humanity in the Son. We as Jesus' people are called to announce and proclaim that victory, that breaking down of division, that way of suffering love to a culture, a nation that desperately needs to hear that message.